I'd like to thank uh, SEMA uh, for sponsoring today's events and making it possible for us to do what we do. Um, and I don't want to take up any more time, so I'm going to throw it over to our moderator, Peggy Hogan. Please join me in welcoming this panel. Thank you. Uh, I'm Peggy Hogan. I'm uh, a recording artist known as Huali here in Montreal. I'm also label manager for Outside Music Next Door Records. And I'm just delighted to be moderating this panel. I'm a former musicologist, so it, it tugs on my heartstrings in, in a variety of fun ways that we'll delve into today. Um, I wanted to just throw it to y'all. I'll have you start, Madeline, and then we'll go to Alana, Amy, and et cetera for self-introductions. So Madeline, take it off. Yeah, so my name is Madeline Lines. Um, I was a producer for the project on the episode on Oshalaga Maisonet. And my pronouns are she, her. Me next, right? All right. Um, my name is uh, Alana DeVito. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I am the lead developer on the Mapping Montreal Music App Project. Um, and I'm a sound artist and composer, and currently I'm going to Columbia University for sound art uh, master's program. Um, yeah, and I went to Concordia for electroacoustic music and computation arts. That's me. Hi, my name is Amy McDonald. I am a musician and uh, an arts, uh, arts administrator, cultural worker, project manager, grant person based here in Montreal for the last 12 years. Um, I'm in a band called Nenen. Um, I most recently have worked for the Festival Sony Pera Popolo and I've been a part of a number of different booking and releasing and otherwise music community, ideally nourishing collectives over the years. And I'm really excited to be on this panel. Oh, and my, my pronouns are she, her. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Francella, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the station manager at CJLO 1690 AM, which is Concordia University's radio station, and the project manager of Mappy Montreal Music, and really thankful to Eve and Pop Montreal for helping us put this panel together, and thank you to Peggy, too. Um, first, I wanted to just give a little bit of uh, non-insider context to what's happening. And then, Francella, I'm going to hand it over to you for the insider context. Um, Mapping Montreal Music is a, a series on the, on the radio station about various music history gems throughout the city. It's extremely illuminating. And there's also a very fun Pokemon Go-esque app that is in development where you walk about the city, collect audio gems, and um, you get to hear a story about where you are in the city as it relates to music. Um, so Francella, I, I wanted to start by just asking you, and I, I think Alana can probably also give some context on this, but I know that there was uh, a, a delightful funding allocation that um, really brought this project to life. Um, but I know that it's your mission at CJLO to really start thinking about alternative radio, um, ways to kind of like expand what CJLO and especially an AM radio station is able to accomplish. Um, so I would love to know more about um, the, the general overview in terms of your philosophy of moving toward digital and um, app development and these kind of longer form storytelling initiatives at the station? Uh, yeah, so uh, before I moved to Montreal, I was living in Halifax and uh, I worked at the campus community radio station at Dalhousie, CKDU. Um, but I also did a project with two other women where we basically did a sound walk of Gottingen Street, which is a street in the north end of Halifax. And after the city of Halifax raised down Africville, uh, many African Nova Scotian uh, folks moved to Godden Street, and then it also became the home of a lot of indigenous people, um, queer folks and artists in the 1980s. Um, but right now, if you go to Godden Street, it, there's a lot of glass condos and uh, 
it's, it's gentrified, basically. So we wanted to create this project uh, to serve as a document and preserve history, but also give uh, new residents a chance to understand um, where they're living in now and the histories of people who had lived there for generations and are now being pushed out. So I had some experience working in sound walks and I was kind of getting tired of thinking of audio projects as only being a podcast, you know, it's only a podcast that lives on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Like, what could we do? <laughs> right, Edna? Like, <laughs> what could we do that's just beyond a podcast or beyond a radio show? And uh, you're right, we did receive a lot of funding for this. We received $50,000 from the Community Radio Fund of Canada. So big thank you to them. Thank you. Big thank you to them. Um, but uh, I was talking with my board of directors about some ideas since this is a regular funding opportunity that comes to campus community radio stations. And side note, campus community radio stations are not eligible for a lot of funding. This is really like our big chance to get any substantial funding. And uh, you know, like they, like they knew my history in Soundwalks and I had done that and I was really interested in seeing how we could do something here at CJLO. And one of our board members who I think it was Alex VJ Collins, who is the host of Ashes to Ashes, um, he suggested like, well, why don't we try to do something like a sound walk and, and marry it with the Montreal music scene? So uh, that was the idea that we pitched. And along the way, before I submitted the application, I got in touch with the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling at Concordia and met Alana, who had a lot of experience in this kind of storytelling and technology. Uh, they, had a, they were able to merge it completely. So it was just kind of like a match made in heaven. And we submitted the application, and we were successful in the funding. And it's, it's dovetailed nicely into what we're trying to achieve at CJLO. It's, it, it, it is my mission personally, but it's also a team effort. I, you know, I couldn't do this without the staff and all of the volunteers who work so hard on their programs and the board of directors. But uh, the idea is that if CJLO is thought of as a music station and has excelled in music programming and music curation, um, what could we do to elevate that? And for me, the answer was music storytelling and comprehensive documentary music storytelling. So that's how the idea of the series came about. CJLO being an AM radio station, outside of the city core, you know, we have those challenges. So I thought, well, if we're on AM, we may as well expand into digital storytelling, you know, head first. And if we're outside the city core and we physically have to meet people where they are, the idea of incorporating geocoding technology was pretty natural for the station. So that's kind of how it came about, but Alana, well, I think you can add in anything that I'm missing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can kind of tell a little bit about how the, particularly the app idea came about before um, Francella approached um, the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling. Um, first of all, I was, there's a, another um, kind of part of the center within, sorry, within the center, it, there's um, the uh, Black Box Theater Studio, um, called the Acts of Listening Lab, which I was working as a research assistant to uh, Dr. Um, uh, Luis Sotelo Castro. Um, and he really focused on oral history and oral history performance, kind of like um, documentary theater, sort of. Uh, and um, during that time, I was also in um, computation arts doing my minor. And I kind of wanted to figure out a way, it was also during the pandemic. So things like, particularly things like sound art um, didn't really have a place to be experienced. Like music, you know, you have your podcast, or sorry, you have like Spotify and, you know, streaming services. So that kind of continues. Obviously we did lose the, you know, concerts and stuff like that. But when it comes to things like sound installation work, um, uh, you're at galleries and um, kind of specific institutional concert situations. So the app actually came about from wanting to show um, kind of unusual um, audio content, like more experimental compositions, um, and have a way for sound artists to like put their compositions around the city. And then you could kind of do uh, experience someone's 
kind of virtual audio installation. So that's kind of what I was playing with at first. And then when Francella approached um, with the Mapping Montreal music um, project, and it just seemed like a great opportunity to take this um, prototype app that I was creating uh, and kind of give it a home in a place where it's a little bit uh, wider range than just sound art, but at the same time, my contribution to it was very much like, let's give the artists in the city and, you know, the producers of these radio shows an opportunity to maybe showcase material that isn't just an audio documentary, isn't just a playlist. They can like do a soundscape or, you know, something maybe we can offer to the musicians to post um, material that they wouldn't usually release as like a song or a record traditionally. It could be something that they've been playing with that they wanted to just put out there for their fans. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of how we, I was on, what I, how I developed it and then, you know, collaborated with uh, Francella to get it to where it is um, now, particularly, but I guess part of the other thing I would say is um, in my, um, work. So I don't usually work as like a developer regularly, but what I do is I use um, coding and different technologies to facilitate a lot of ideas I have for my interdisciplinary work. So I use, so um, it, it just, it's a fun way to create unusual ideas because you can kind of build anything you want when you know some code. <laughs> so, yeah. Um. I really love this idea around storytelling bringing value to music. And it's something I've been thinking a lot about in terms of um, my musicology nerdery, but also uh, in the context of radio, um, it's come up so many times this week when I'm talking to other label heads, the idea that radio is being outpaced by streaming tenfold now. And um, where once, even though streaming became a primary space for music discovery, it is now largely overtaking radio as um, a major revenue stream, which, which is still actually relatively new. So I'm thinking about what are the other ways that we value music that are not just like royalties and listening. Um, and I, I feel that context is something that can really increase music's value. Um, it's, this is a question I would really love um, to throw first to Amy and then open it up to the group. Um, just as an artist and someone that is a programmer and you know, a, a deep music lover, um, how does getting historical and cultural context around a music piece affect your valuation of that music? As, as both artist and programmer? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, how does it? I think partly it situates, it's sort of like both, a, like, I, so I'm, I'm think, thinking kind of two opposite things <laughs> um, that I think are both true and kind of come together at the end of the thought. The first thing is that there's a kind of magic to context that people really kind of almost fetishize the conditions under which a specific piece of music was created to the point where, um, you know, like you're pouring through, like I remember being a teenager and just pouring through the liner notes of albums that I loved, trying to figure out like, okay, who did this? Who did that? Who did this? Um, who back up sang on this Neil Young song or whatever? And, uh, <laughs> um, and so there's there's a, there's a kind of like um, I think sometimes context can can be like a shortcut to like why is this thing so powerful like why is this piece of music so magical why is does it ha why does it have a, such a, such a strong effect um, it can either like I think people sometimes look to that as an explanatory thing which I'm maybe like. It's not, it's maybe, I've, I've maybe preferred to see it as like an ingredient in the overall kind of stew of, of what, a what and where a particular piece of music um, was shaped by. Um, and then the second thing that I'm thinking, which is kind of the opposite of that, like fetishization of like, oh, that's why that thing is so amazing and they made that amazing thing and it's special and, and different. 
versus like sometimes when I am reading about an artist whose work I admire or when I'm like listening to these episodes, these podcast, or sorry, specifically not podcast episodes, um, <laughs> which I experienced unfortunately in, uh, because I have an Android, I can't test the app. So sadly um, experienced them in a rather podcast like way when I was listening. But um, Definitely, like even just thinking about like hearing people say like yeah we we're putting we were putting on shows like people were putting on shows in church basements we're putting on shows in near the railroad tracks we're putting on like it I think context also has the effect as an artist personally of kind of situating me in a in a long line of musicians that will like that has preceded me and will continue after me and it's really deeply comforting it's it's like humbling and also really really relaxing to me to be like okay so they didn't pull that out of thin air like there were there were conditions that created it that are you know, there are conditions around music and there are conditions around my music and my practice and my community too. And that puts us within a, a long, long legacy of people who are just like trying to make this music thing happen under whatever, in whatever ways they can, whether that's with like a Tascam or like a famous console that the Beatles recorded on, you know, like the story of it can, can help make it um, both more magical and also more accessible, I think is the, the very short version of what I just said in a very long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really identify also as an artist with the idea of um, how comforting it is to feel part of um, part of a tradition. And on one hand, there's always like the tradition of the genre that you're participating in, but there's something very special about the physicality of like uh, there's like a real tradition of like a DIY um, DIY conditions in Montreal that have proliferated so many types of music. And I think that's something that mapping Montreal music really illuminates is like how long and vast that tradition is and how um, we are all still very much a part of that and a part of making that for future generations. And what are the forces that threaten that, which has come up as a theme in a lot of these episodes. Um, you know, Madeline's episode focused on gentrification and that's like, um, Maisonneuve, but you know, we could have made this whole series just about gentrification and how that's affecting the music scene in Montreal. So specifically looking at, okay, how is it affecting this borough as opposed to this borough? Who's coming into this borough and that borough? And how is that affecting the respective scenes, respective genres, respective players, venues in that borough? And that's something that we wanted to, what we wanted to do. Yeah, and especially in terms of putting things in context, one thing I found interesting while making my episode was putting artists in conversation with their own songs. So there is this song by Claude Lanthrope that I happened upon, it's called Oshlaga Mon Amour, and it's very much, it's almost romanticizes, you know, the, the changes in Oshlaga and the things that they love about it, the things they hate about it. Um, but I found I really came to have a different understanding of that song when I talked to Claude about it and you know they had said they were able to add this context that makes me see it in a whole different light they were talking about how you know people throw it in documentaries about Hoshleg all the time now and it was meant to be a song that was just for a group of friends and it, it felt like this very like intimate thing that now is kind of I don't know used as a theme song for gentrification in Hoshleg. Um, so yeah, that's the value that you get about talking to musicians about their songs, about their work down the line too, reflecting on past work. Um, and yeah, it ended up that they had, you know, something that was really beautiful about the Hoshlega episode in particular is it is such a neighborhood that there, everyone is extremely proud to be from there. They love to make music specifically about the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, that was wonderful. And it turned out that Claude actually pointed me to a song that they felt represented their understanding of the neighborhood a bit more, was a little bit less sugar-coated. Um, and so, yeah, that, that comes out of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I see music as an incredibly temporal art form. Um, it's something that, you know, it's, you, you don't get to choose necessarily. Like, it's not like you can, sta you can stand in front of a painting for hours, but you're at a show for a certain amount of time. Like, music moves through time, there's always a passage there. Um, which is one of my favorite and most, I, I think, juicy ways to think about music as an art form. The downside to that being that there are no monuments to music. And I think 
that's something I find incredibly fascinating about this project is that it brings a real physicality to an art form that, um, aside from the live show experience, which is also very temporal and temporary and ephemeral, um, there's no real physical, you know, there's, there's no artifact, there's no monument to this incredible art form. Um, so I do wanna throw it to Alana first um, and then open up to the rest of the panelists around the idea of creating the map, um, the, the exercise of the audio gems and traveling through the city to, you know, collect these kind of digital, um, digital icons that illuminate the story. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting you, the way you frame this about, sorry, sorry. Oh. No, all good. Uh, Go, sorry, go can you hear me? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, um, I, it's interesting how you frame this about um, the monuments and kind of the physicality, like bringing physicality to this ephemeral art form. Um, it's actually something very common within like the study of sound art in particular, just because like, for example, like what I'm studying uh, at Columbia right now, and it's all it's integrated into um, a program with other artists that do painting and these tip, these these art forms that have more of a physical representation. And how does sound art and music, of course, are like, how does that fit into the world? How can it exist among these very more materialistic kind of creations? Um, so in terms of the app, it is definitely one way to give people a connection between what they hear and how it lives in their world physically. Um, it's a difficult thing sometimes um, because there is a magic to music and to sound art um, because of its immateriality, really. Um, but at the same time, we can't fight the fact that as humans, we do kind of want something that we can latch on to in the, in the real world a little bit, something that that we can kind of connect with a little bit in a in like the in a physical form so the app definitely is a part of that kind of discussion in the kind of bigger world of of sound and music and how yeah how to connect it to pe how to connect with people on a level that other art forms don't have to worry about because it's already built into how they how it works in the world so I hope that kind of explains a little bit um, in terms of the app for me and and why it uh, it's it's an important um, project I think to kind of yeah give it give a new a new a new way to experience yeah something so magical as sound music. There may not be monuments, but I think in Montreal there are lots of public displays of appreciation of some of the artists who have come mm. here. You know, there are countless Leonard Cohen murals, there are a few of Oscar Peterson. Uh, in Little Italy, you see the Beau Dommage mural. So there are some hints of that. Um, but for us, it was more about serving our mandate as a campus community radio station and not necessarily telling those stories because those stories have been told tons of tons of times. But let's dig deeper and, and think of and tell the stories and celebrate the stories of artists who are working today and want to work you know, tomorrow and the next year and the year after that. And let's celebrate and focus those stories. And the people, the places, the institutions, the actual physical landmarks that have contributed to the contemporary music scene um, and you know, usher in a new era, so to speak. So that's something that we wanted to do. There, there are a lot of tangible instances of commemoration here in Montreal, um, but it doesn't tell the full picture, which was ultimately what we wanted to accomplish, was to try to tell that full picture. I'm interested in um, wh what, wh what the thinking was behind the particular places where the gems are placed on within the app. Um, you know, how did you narrow it down to like, well, this is this is the this is the space that is going to represent this piece of the story? Yeah, I mean, um, there's like a tech limitation. That's one thing that we had to um, take into consideration. 
um, with our producers, we did tell them very explicitly, like, this is going to be also an, a project with an app where we would like users to uncover specific audio gems at specific locations. So in your episodes, do think about how you can integrate specific places. So in, in Madeline's episode, for instance, she focuses a lot on the Battle of Lofts Moreau. So naturally, that would be one of the spaces where a user would uncover an audio gem. Um, in the episode about the Mile End, where we're here today, um, we have various points along the railroad tracks, um, some at the Van Horn underpass, which everybody knows is a pretty iconic Mile End location for music. Uh, so really just thinking about, okay, well, what are, th what are the things that people may already know and are probably expecting? And if they're expecting that, how can we give them something unexpected in terms of storytelling content, in terms of uh, music? And, and then others, we wanted to see, okay, well, what are things that maybe people might not know as much? So in our downtown episode, for instance, we wanted to um, place an audio gem at the old Limelight location, which is a pretty storied, lo uh, storied institution, but only if you're only if you're deep into the Montreal music scene. And we know that for our audience, which is a younger audience, who m and you know, frankly, people who come from other cities to study at Concordia, they might not know anything about the limelight. So that might be something that we would want to showcase. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that kind of strikes me about um, the, the bit of listening I have done to this series is um, I haven't been able to access, I haven't been doing the walks of the, the app yet, but I've been thinking about this, and, and maybe this is something you can speak to, Madeline, the idea that so often you hear these stories, um, especially if, if they're coming to you in podcast form, and th there's, this, uh, there's this work of the imagination of like, okay, I'm listening to the journalist or the narrator tell the story of where I am, or where they are, and, and the interactions that they're having. Um, and I would imagine that if you're in the neighborhood picking up your gem, listening to it, walking around, and having that very physical experience while hearing the story, you almost get to have the feeling of being the journalist. Yeah, it definitely is supposed mm. to add this other kind of dimension to it. And like Francella said, we had that in mind going into the project. Everyone was trying to think with that in mind, think about walking other people through it. And something that I found really effective was, I think it was Aiden's episode on downtown Villeneuve. Um, it's actually, if you listen to the full episode, it's in first person. And it's taken on a night where they bump into friends, but it really, I found it really effective that it was in first person. It's like, you bump into your, you're in line and you bump into your friend, you, s you, s you spot them with the blue hair and you, you talk to them about how their night's going. And like, that was extremely effective for me. Um, and yeah, just kind of opened my mind to um, how these stories can be told. That was what I really loved about this project was that um, Francella and the team at CJ Lowe just kind of let everyone approach it in the way that they would like to or try it different ways. And there's a great variety of ways that you'll explore different neighborhoods and hear different stories. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciated listening back to the other producers' work, just the the variety and, and how different people on a walk through a neighborhood will notice different things and think of different memories and m different stories will be interesting to them. And so, yeah. I wanna, um, I wanna bring some spice to the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, it strikes me that this is a, like a huge project with so many components, uh, a huge team, a lot of voices, and um, I want to know what were the challenges, what surprised you most about putting it together, um, what, what were like the spiciest things that you learned, and Amy, to include you in this, um, as a listener, what were kind of the things that were like, whoa, I had no idea, or this was like a really interesting twist that I've discovered. So. Whoever wants to jump in first about some spicy content, go for it. Well, I mean, this was a very ambitious project for CJLO. I don't know if we've done a project of this magnitude. Uh, we've certainly done some tech projects, and we've certainly done some 
multi-step, multi-year tech projects, but uh, this was something that was really outside the box and really innovative. Um, so there were many challenges. We did have to pivot a few times in terms of direction, in terms of episodes. Um, you know, just securing the producers was challenging because we wanted to make sure we had a nice plurality of voices and different perspectives and different um, different people who could serve as authorities on specific genres, specific years, specific scenes. Um, it's a tech project, and something that I think Alana could speak to is that in tech projects, there are lots of things that can go sideways. And this tech <laughs> project being very, very complicated um, required a lot of rigorous testing. And uh, that was something that we definitely felt was a challenge. Um, and it is still in the testing mode technically, but even before we launched it publicly, I think, I think that was one thing we could have benefited more from, more testing, more feedback, more, um, just more content that we could have uh, used to make it even stronger. As Amy pointed out, it's currently only available on uh, iOS, on iPhone. We're, we're thankful to the CRFC for granting us a second round of funding so that we can continue this project and expand it and add more content and make it available on an Android devices. But uh, knowing that we kind of had to limit how many people would experience this in full was obviously a challenge going into it. Um, and I'd say like one thing that I didn't expect, well, I think the episode on the Plateau Mont Royal is, is, is really strong just because I didn't realize just how fractured the history of the Tam Tams are. And that was something that I thought mm -hmm. Aviva Lassard, our producer for that episode, really did a good, good job in showing just how many people claim to be the inventor of the Tam Tams here in Montreal. And uh, there's like some contention around that. And we know the Tam Tams is kind of a meme, kind of a joke, uh, but for many people, it's their family, it's their livelihood, it's so important to them. And the, the point at the end of the episode where it's really the last thing in Montreal that has yet to be commodified. You know, we kind of, I, I'm sure you can see like a lot of merch just about like construction cones or the expos or all the other jokes in Montreal that we toss aside, but the Tam Tams, there's nothing out there like that yet. So that was something that really struck me. Uh, no Tam Tam tote bag yet, maybe one day. <laughs> That's uh, open open market for that. If anyone wants to run with that idea, free ideas on this panel, everyone. <laughs> that was also my spicy thing, and the the way that the episode was structured was so interesting because at first it's like the, this Quebecois couple went traveling and brought home a drum, and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> That, but my skepticism <laughs> alert went off as soon as I heard that. I was like, are you sure the first djembe came in the 80s? Like, it totally. sounds really late. I, I don't know. I looked at the time mark and I was like, there's like 20 minutes left in the episode. I got to just listen. And, and then it eventually got to the end and the inter they, they interviewed with the Senegalese musician. And I was like, oh, interesting. It, just, it, was, it was exactly this like, exactly this thing of competing narratives where you can imagine that like there were different ingredients of like this person getting together a big drum circle probably played a role in you know, there, there being some kind of awareness and then this person obviously like sharing specifically like going through the phone book and calling people with Senegalese last names to like create community. For, like I'm, sh you know, it's just, it's, it was a really interesting, I think way of storytelling where it's like, here's this narrative and here's this narrative and here's this narrative. And um, I just, I loved that. Uh, I loved that. I thought that was really, really cool. And it sort of like, creates this, or for me personally as a listener, it created a bit of a contention right at the beginning that made me want to keep listening <laughs> and like figure out what was going on. Well, that's good. That's what we wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that also goes to show like when I was listening to that episode, like it pretty, you know, it's generally about the Plateau neighborhood, but it focuses so deeply in on one story in such an effective way. And it made me think like just, the richness of the city and how many different, you know, that's um, speaking back to like a challenge that I came across was going into this neighborhood that I don't live in and feeling like there are so many incredible stories here, which ones do we tell? And that's a huge responsibility. And so, yeah, and the fact that you can take one story and it can be an entire episode and we could make, you know, hours and hours of stories uh, yeah, that was a big challenge for sure. Um, for me, 
I picked up on where a previous producer left off, Shalin Hoiwe, who is from Hoshulega, so that was really helpful in kind of planting the seeds for me. Um, but yeah, something that's a challenge, but also like the beauty of this project is how many more stories there are to tell, is how I think of it. Can I add a quick spice? Yeah. Ding. What about Verdun? Yeah. Yeah. I, I live mean, in Verdun. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's and so much potential with this, this is, app, right? I mean, like it made me expand. it made me think about like the fact that Verdun was a dry borough for many, many years, and with the alcohol industry tied into the music industry the way that it is, I'm sure that that's contributed to there being like at least optically a lack of uh, a, an apparent like surface level. And this is the thing. I'm like, where is where is it? I know it's here. It's it's springing up more. I think there's more stuff going on in Verdun, like just surface level than previously, but anyway, that's my question. Looks like you're going to have to hire Amy to produce yeah. an uh -oh. episode. Amy, I want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have more funding, so. <laughs> um, Alana. Mm -hmm. Tragedies as a uh, developer, delightful discoveries, lay it on us. Um, I mean, really, for me, it comes down to how I kind of do my projects as an artist to be honest which is tends to be experimental and there this is no exception it was um kind of you know learning as as you go and problem solving constantly and you know you're constantly understanding certain um limits to the technology and how to work around it and the nice thing is um within the coding community it's quite um important to help each other out with code so it was cool to um to just kind of you know learn from people all over all over the place um, how to improve the app how to you know make my way around issues um so in terms of like the technical side it was definitely you know a constant learning uh process and um yeah, the nicest part was once I was finally putting the um, material in and I got to hear all the really cool episodes, well, the little audio gems that the producers had put, to, had put together and the different ways that each producer um, kind of um, decoded the the uh, what an audio gem is to them. Like, I really liked that because um, the concept for the audio gem, like the name was something... I was kind of rolling around in my head and like, how do I communicate this? Like, you know, how are people going to understand like what it is to them and how they're going to create their own audio gems? And I thought it was important to, to kind of, to a certain point, uh, I don't I, if, if you can um, maybe shed light on this a little bit. I mean, we did kind of direct the producers a little bit in terms of what an audio gem was, but then in the end, all the different, um, the, the different episodes are really a reflection of how all the different producers um, understood that kind of part of the project. And I really, really like that. Um, yeah, it, it keeps it very, like e each experience is quite unique, which I, I really love. Yeah, personally. no, I would agree. Like everybody had a different approach to it. I mean, we gave them standard guidelines of like, okay, keep it, you know, two to seven minutes in length. And here are the different kinds of categories interview clip and music and feature which can be a soundscape um one producer the uh, multi leander who did our uh, episode on little italy actually made his own compositions um for that episode which also talked about gentrification but his approach was to make audio art that reflected how gentrification could sound like so in the episode you hear his composition and you just hear audio cycling in and out panning from ear to ear, uh, and those are available as audio gems as well if you're walking through Little Italy. So I haven't tried it yet. I'll, I'll have to do a walk of Little Italy soon, but to, to see the, the neighborhood as it is now, while also hearing that, um, I think could be such an incredible experience, and that's what ultimately we want our users to take away from it. Um, what episode was Blue Oil on? Blue Oil? They're uh, the they're the um, the first female, all female post punk band. I read about it in the Cult MTL article you sent me. Oh, I think 
Uh, well, our, uh, our first producer's son, Noor, um, who handled St. Michelle uh, Mile X, I think, uh, I think that was just like an example of like a story that okay. they wanted to uncover. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like th the point is like there are just so many stories and we have to, we have to just make decisions. But really, w w whenever I hear something like that of like, what about this? What about Verdun? What about, what about all these things? It just reminds me of how much potential there is in this project where we could just keep expanding, keep adding more content, uh, keep implementing more elements. You know, we talked about having a social element where you would upload your own audio gem and talk about uh, certain experiences you had, uh, implementing more AR, more VR, so like it can, it just has a lot of legs. And I think for us as a campus radio station, it's like, well, how do we s make sure it's still radio? How do we make sure it still fits within our mandate? Yeah, um, I just, I, I bring up Blue Oil only because I, I think that was like one of the surprises as I was learning about this project. Um, I find it, y'all have done really, really deep work as researchers. And I mean, I'm a, I've been in Montreal for 15 years and I, I came to this city because of the Mile End scene, you know, and as, as I think many people did at around that time. Um, but when I think about post-punk, I think about Constellation Records and Godspeed and like to me that's like the, the crux of it all. So then to find out that, okay, there was actually really like this, the tradition of this is much longer and um, exists in like different parts of the city is so illuminating and um, yeah, I think that's a wonderful piece of the project. It's very inspiring as an artist to see that as well. Totally agree. Um, yeah, it was, it was so, I think one thing, like as much as we can be like, what about my neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> Which I immediately felt bad for doing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's just, there's just so much we can do. Um, there's also so many, like, I loved in the Mile End episode how in the first, like, I don't know, the first two to five minutes, the producer's like, here's, here's the, here's what everybody knows. Moving on. Like, it, or not moving on, but it, it was much more rich and complex than that. But um, as someone who, like, as a member of a, of a, of a, of a sort of interlocking set of music scenes that, largely do still take place in Little Italy and um, in uh, Mile End and in the neighborhoods kind of around here, you're constantly, or at least I guess I can only speak, I can only speak for myself, but there have been moments where um, we come sort of directly face to face with that mythos when our bands get compared confusingly to Grimes <laughs> or, <laughs> You know, dis despite being like a noise band or whatever, like there's just there. Uh, that's just one anecdote. That's very strange. Um, but there's different, there's different things. Uh, there's different ways in which that mythos both like feeds, um, feeds, and also like puts up these weird limiting understandings. Um, and it can be kind of strange to bump into them over and over again. Um, and. Uh, it was so nice that this this series did such a good job, and that episode did such a good job of just drilling right down into something that really deserve into stories that really do deserve more attention. Yeah. I've always thought that this the phrase the Montreal music scene is just like incoherent. Yeah. Like, there's there's you know there's so much more happening. There, if you're wondering who are the people in Montreal who are doing this or that thing, the answer is almost always you just haven't met them yet. Like, you just got to find it. And I thought that that. Overall, the series did a really nice job of like drilling, drilling down into that into that layer. Well, with the mile end uh, mile end episode specifically, um, we made a point of not wanting to focus on Arcade Fire, the Unicorns Wolf Parade, the Deers, um, even you know Constellation Hotel Tatango, so to speak, um, because I feel like when people say Montreal music scene, they really mean that time, that era, those people. And, you know, like, of course, the music has been very impactful and very influential, but there's got to be more to the mile end than just that. And we knew we had to treat that episode with a lot of thought and a lot of care, and we needed to find a producer who was able to tell those stories. And uh, we're really happy that we got Zoe Bailey to uh, share those stories and talk about the queer DIY scene in the mile end who have been here for generations and are threatened by police action all the time. And that's not something that you hear when you read about um, all those bands that I mentioned. 
So yeah, we made a point specifically not to cover those there because nobody wants to hear that from CJLO. You know, we'll leave that to CVC and show. Yeah, and also thinking about just the purpose of the project, like if those stories have been told already, you know, like you want to be finding out things that you didn't know that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. Yeah. I would like to do, um, I if I may elect myself as a producer, I yeah. if, if I could produce You're an hired. if I could produce an episode, the audio gem would start in Victoria. And it would be like the story of hearing the unicorns for the first time. And then being like, oh, I'm obsessed with the city. And then like, oh, Wolf Parade. Oh, they're from Victoria, too. And like, I could make this journey. <laughs> um, everyone who knows me well knows that I'm obsessed with the unicorns. And I always credit them to bringing me here, chasing them over here, and then being like, oh, you're just regular guys on the scene. Um, I'm not knocking them. I like the unicorns, too. Yeah. Um, as a former musicologist, something that I really, really thought about a lot was um, the idea of public musicology and um, how, how to bring this kind of in-depth research into the public sphere and um, take it out of the ivory tower, make it accessible, make it um, something that is consumable, like no one wants to read an academic paper not even other academics most of the time. So um, something that I find deeply admirable about this project is just how digestible it is. Um, and I want to throw this question first to Amy and Alana. Um, specifically, one of the things I think about when it comes to public musicology is that um, there, there comes a very interesting kind of relationship between the, the musicologist or music researcher journalist and the artist, where it's kind of like the artist is making this thing and then there is this like context, but they're not always intertwining with each other. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I have to get going. Um, right, well, I can answer one more question though. Um, uh, okay, I'm, did I'm, you, I promise yeah, I'll Yeah, do you want to finish your question and I'll, I'll, I'll end with that, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, all that to say, when musicology is made public, it's able to have more of a conversation with the artist in the sense of like, it's not just the art being analyzed, but the artist is able to be influenced by understanding the lineage, the story around it, the circumstances with which created the, the circumstances which created the opportunity for them to make art in the present moment. So, we'll throw it to Alana first before you leave. Um, uh, from an artist standpoint, I'm, I'm wondering like, where has this project taken you in terms of thinking about your own work? Well, I actually, I like what you're saying in terms of like, um, more like knowing, getting to know how the art is made and what kind of what comes from behind it. Um, because a lot of the time I found as a musician, I was, I played in bands for many years. Um, I got really frustrated, especially as a femme person, when I would try to ask about how things were, you know, how a song was made, how to do a solo, like really early on. And it always being this like, oh, the musician is untouchable and it's this magic thing that happens and nobody wants to share or it happens with the arts as well, where it's like, it's like you're kind of holding on to like the mystery behind your work, which I thought was very frustrating. And it perpetuates this very, this idea that creating art and creating music is only for the select few that are touched by the creative gods or something, which is very untrue. It takes a lot of work to, you know, be an artist, to be a musician. And it comes from, you know, a long history of people who influenced us and who helped us and the communities which help us, um, to learn and you know become better artists become better musicians and I don't find I never found this kind of holier than thou kind of energy helpful or very good within the community anyway so I really liked I really like it when people open up and you know show kind of how they created the work how they became an artist uh, who influenced them what's the the history of it and it just creates a richness and an openness to art creation um, that I think is important. And I, yeah, so it basically, I, I just, I, I think it really fosters a better art community 
when you allow these stories to come out and you and you get you know more human in terms of how art is created and how it does take a community to create these like rich experiences so yeah thanks Alana that explains I, it. I will let you <laughs> no run problem. I know you have an exciting uh, other presentation to do um, so thank you for joining us and in the meantime I will throw the same question to you Amy can you do a quick recap of the question Absolutely. The TLDR that you had at the end. Right. So the idea of um, oftentimes music research exists in a vacuum. It's researchers kind of like observing art, talking about it, transmitting it amongst themselves, but that it doesn't often get back to the artist. And in this project, it, it is this really full circle thing in the sense that um, even one of the pillars of this project was like, we want to talk about current stuff and, and what will be happening in the future and how things are changing. So I want to know as an artist who has now taken in these stories, um, where is this taking you and your thoughts about your practice? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me listening to the episodes that I was able to listen to and the stories that are part of those episodes, it's again this like... Um, it's grounding and situating in a way that I think sometimes when you, sometimes it's, sometimes I find it easy to imagine that, um, or like to sort of fall into the trap of thinking like, you know, I should be doing more or my, this isn't enough or like we need to do this and we need to do that. And like, I, it's sort of like without, without sort of lapsing into complacency, I think it's lovely to remember that there's an entire ecosystem that has many, many, many corners that I didn't know about before. I listened to these episodes, like, um, like, like the series of parties that are being thrown in Mal End, or like the the rap shows that are happening in Montreal Nord. Like these just are not on my radar for whatever reason, and that's that's like really, really comforting to me to remember that there's so many, like I was saying before, just such a such an incredible ecosystem here. And at the same time, it makes me feel incredibly responsible for, okay. Something I was thinking about before when we were talking about ephem ephemerality, um, I'm a loud guitarist, so I always experience music as spatial. Like I work with spa space to create feedback. Um, I need a certain kind of isolation in order to make the amount of noise that I need to make in order to get the, the type of sound I need to get. Um, and like, I haul gear everywhere, all the time. It's exhausting, I'm 35, I need to start working out, I'm gonna break something. So it's an incredibly physical, <laughs> my practice always has felt incredibly physical and embodied to me, particularly like vocal, vocal work to me is very physical and embodied. So I was, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about like, oh, ephemerality, physicality, temporality, and then I think something that I've been wondering recently is whether we're applying, like whether in conversations about gentrification in particular, I promise I'm going somewhere with the question, um, that we apply the idea of ephemerality in kind of, a, in kind of a romanticized way of like, oh, La Plante, it lasted, like that space was, was DIY spaces for 10 straight years at least, I think. Before it was La Plante, it was, help me. L'envers. Yes, before it was L'envers, it was something else. L'Envers was like the first place I came to a show here when I moved here. I was part of the plant collective for a couple years. Like, but it's like, it's the sense of like, that's the exception that it lasted for 10 years. And every like silver door, um, uh, poisson, poisson rouge, poisson noir, anywhere that's been this DIY space, we have this sense that like, of course it's gonna be inevitable. So we better go and ex experience it while it lasts. And like, of course it's gonna end because gentrification is inevitable. And I don't think gentrific, I don't think, I don't think that gentrification, the way that it happens, is inevitable. I think we can imagine better than that. <laughs> I think we can organize better than that. And I'm speaking as somebody who's like, you know, probably not gonna be the fire starter, but I'll go to the meetings. <laughs> but like, I'm just thinking about, in particular, the hotel project that's been the subject of much debate that's up on Van Horn, that's like, everyone's like, okay, well, peace, see ya up at Chabanel. And it's like, sure, like our spaces perhaps are going to march ever northwards, and there have there has been stuff, you know, Chabanel is a well-established like creative zone. Um, but I do wonder what happened. What would happen if we insisted on music being 
not ephemeral in that sense? What if we insisted on these spaces existing and continuing to exist? Like, what if we put a foot down and we're like, no, actually, we, just in the same way that artists actively, actively contribute to gentrification, what if we actively contribute to fighting against it is a question I have. Mm -hmm. And how does it relate to your question? I had a thread <laughs> that I lost. I mean, that was the wonderful so point. Here, so. But hearing this, okay, tying it back to this project, <laughs> here, hearing the stories really made me think about this. It made me think about, um, you know, the fact that Tam Tams has been in place for 40 years and there's, you know, we can treat it like, you know, like a, we can take it for granted, but that was the result of some incredibly intentional community building and a lot of love and care. Um, I think it's possible to imagine that all of these projects, you know, like for all, it, I, I recognize the incredible amount of work that goes into sustaining a space in the face of gentrification and I would never fault anyone for making the decision to shut or to end or whatever. Um, these stories also did make me think about like, in terms of my practice, like what are my, what are my ties to the community that's not just like aesthetically affiliated with me, but it's like physically around me and like economically dependent on uh, the structures that my practice affects and is part of. Um, I'm going, to, this is the disclaimer that we're going to open it up to audience questions at any moment. So do get your questions ready. Um, there's a microphone set up that you can go toward at that moment. Um, I just want to speak to your point about gentrification and, and the artist role, which is something I think about all the time, and I've been on so many panels this year about this. Um, but I think about um, especially T-Base in Toronto and the idea that it, it was actually artists that went into the mall on Spadina and created a space that were like, okay, we're doing that artist, art city model of like, we're giving this property value by being artists, but in a very intentional way of like, no, we don't want the businesses around us to change. Absolutely, we wanna keep this a community and intergenerational, spa intergenerational space. And despite the fact that we're young contemporary artists, a huge part of what they try to do is bring in the intergenerational art and highlight the idea that in Chinatowns there has always been art as a practice and music as a practice in these spaces. Um, and Chinatown Working Group in Montreal's Chinatown has also done a really great job of that and um, have actually successfully fought most of the development um, uh, initiatives in that neighborhood over the last little while. So. All of that to say, Amy, I think that's a great point. And there is a way for artists to be involved in a really, really conscious way to um, at once bring value to a neighborhood and also not make that value something that is um, directly translatable into dollar signs for developers. And just to bring it back to the project, the one of the only ways you, well, one of the ways you can, you can do that is to understand the history and to understand the contemporary scene and to really understand the people and places and all the work that goes into sustaining a specific scene in the borough. And again, that's what we were trying to do with this project. We wanna shed a light on all those things. We wanna shed a light on all the incredible art that's being made here today and uh, hasn't received all the support from the city and from other major players that it should. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we wanted to do with this. And like I said, we could have done this whole series just about gentrification and how it impacts artists, and maybe that will be the next project we work on. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I would love to open it up to the audience to talk to us about your experiences, learning about music history context, if you've navigated the app or your curiosities about the app. This is your moment to shine. Okay, we're gonna move on then. Thank you for your exuberant participation. I know it is the last day of pop, so everyone's brains are working a little slowly. Um, I have some questions that I would like to ask um, more broadly about kind of the future of radio, of which I think this project does also eke toward the sense of like, there's parts of this project that live on the radio 
and then there's obviously very much these other parts that don't. Um, and I like this idea that like radio will always be radio, but it's also going to be so much more and so much further reaching. So um, Francella and, and Madeline, I, I would love to hear more about your perspective about um, where you see the future of community radio going. That's, that's a great question. It's a big question. I, I know many people in the sector that I work with grapple with that question every single day. It's one that I grapple with every single day. And the thing that I always say about CJLO, and I've used it in many grants and in many uh, interviews that I've done, is that CJLO, we're trying to disrupt uh, traditional radio storytelling and audio storytelling. And for all the factors that I mentioned previously, we're on the AM, we're a newer station compared to a station like CKUT or CISM or uh, any other station in the campus community radio sector. Um, we're outside of the city core. So using those supposed weaknesses as actual strength and how we can use that to propel us to be more innovative, to meet audiences where they are, and to do things that really help the musicians in our scene beyond just playing them on the radio. What else can we do to shed a light on these artists on platforms that young people and young listeners, new people to Montreal interested in the music scene would be on? So I, I mean, the future of community radio, there will always be community radio because there will always be community. People will always want to care for each other and take care of each other and will want to create a space that exists outside of mainstream broadcasting. But I think for us at CJLO, we want to expand that space <coughs> even further. Right, Edna? <laughs> we do want to expand the space even further and want to think beyond the confines of what radio has always meant, you know, beyond the radio clock, beyond a transmission tower, beyond a mixing console on the studio. Uh, so really, really trying to expand into areas of sound art, audio art installations, uh, and digital projects like this. Yeah, absolutely. Going off of what Francella said, the community part, I think, is also what makes it super special to me. I had a very brief intro, but I also, I'm the funding and outreach coordinator at CQT. So I, a lot of my job is meeting, especially around the funding drive, meeting people who really care about the station and you get to see what is important about community, campus community radio. Um, and yeah, it is, it is special just being able to, there's just this familiarity to it. And yeah, I think that there's the challenge of um, imagining the future of campus community radio is exactly what Francella was saying is like, we want to be expanding it into new places, um, but also keep the heart of, of what makes it special, the heart of you know what keeps you know a 90 year old in Verdun tuning in to the show on Sunday. You know, like there's a we want to toe the line between innovating and doing all these digital things, but also like the radio part of it is still at the heart of it and so important, um, especially to people who you know, can't, yeah, older people or just anyone who m might not be able to figure out how an app works. Like, that's why it's so important that we play the episodes over the good old radio as well. So yeah, it's it's all about towing that line, having fun with it, um, and yeah, rem reminding yourself of what, what is special about it to begin with. Um, yeah. Uh, I, as a former music researcher, I think community radio is so special because there is so much history that lives at the radio station. Like the archive is incredible. And also just like things like, um, like Butcha T at, at CKUT, like he has one of the longest running hip hop shows in, in the city and is like kind of the guy that brought hip hop to Montreal. And like, as a hip hop researcher, I was like, like what? Like, okay, I can sit down and talk to you and I, I can access you because like, you just have this radio show and I know like other people at the station that can introduce us, this is incredible. Um, and so all of that to say, I think one of my big takeaways in terms of this conversation today and um, interacting with the episodes is the idea that it is so important for these things to exist simultaneously, that that community radio space is the place where music history, local music history lives, and that must continue on. 
at the same time, it's really, really beautiful to see these innovative ways to take it out of the station into physically experiencing audio in the neighborhood that you're walking around in and also um, into the new digital realm. So I think this is a wonderful place to wrap up and I wanna just thank Francella for being um, the hero and champion of this project and it's a team, it's a team effort, as you say. <laughs> bringing uh, this conversation. Yeah, so I have to thank the here. program director Chris Aikens. I have to thank music director Calvin Cash, and I have to thank the board of directors, our art director Angelica Calcanelli, who makes it look so nice. Alana, of course, for being the developer. Um, all the producers, Madeline, who's here. So a team effort, 100 percent. Oh, and also George McFarlane, who George helped McFarlane. me immensely when I was anxious about getting good audio. So yeah, they were amazing. Amazing. Um, once again, thank you, Francella, Amy, Madeline. A distant thank you to Alana, who is also here, and to Pop, Eve, Pop Symposium, and all of you for being here. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you.